Hello and welcome to another one of those videos where I take a look at what Johan has been talking about in the Tinto Talks. And then we talk about what Johan has been talking about in the Tinto Talks. Let's talk about it. Let's go. The first one we're going to get to is this one right here. Uh, the question is not so important, but basically here we have three more weeks of purely economical dev diaries after this one. So stay tuned. And I believe the next one is actually going to be about loans. We'll have that at some point in this list. Uh, I've seen it already. Again, I've picked them all out. Uh, next up, we have here, will high taxation do more than only reducing how much a faction likes you? And by faction, I believe he means a state. Could it reduce their influence, reduce their amount of pops, etc.? So, it reduces their influence long term, I guess, because they're going to have less money. Uh, yeah, because they're going to get poorer. We have here, is the taxation rate set in steps, as in every 5%, or does it work in 1% increments? And it actually goes in 0.1% increments, which is kind of huge. That is way more granularity than I think anyone really expected. Um, and while there has been a little bit of a, not complaint, but a discussion about are these sliders really needed? Is it false depth? Uh, I think this is going to work out really well. And I believe at some point he says the AI is actually much better at working with this system than a button click system. So this is good. Um, here are mercenaries getting a rework because in EU4 they are effectively free troops. Uh, so Kit Chaos is wrong. Uh, this is this is not true. Uh, they don't understand what um, EU4, sorry, yeah, EU4 mercenaries are at all like. Um, but they are not good in EU4. Like, they're powerful, but they're not good gameplay-wise. So, uh, I put this in here because if it was just a yes, I, I feel like that's kind of an obvious thing. Mercenaries will change. Big news. But a hell yes? That's something a bit more powerful that's something a bit more relevant and a bit more exciting as well seeing a change to the mercenary system is something i would very much welcome so glad to see that uh inflation is increased by minting coins what reduces it not minting has a small reduction but there are other ways as well uh, i guess the other ways we will see at some point in the future uh when we talk about how the economy itself works next three weeks are more about the economy um and it seems now that you don't get income from any of that, but instead your estates will get all the income from that, and then your income will be based entirely on the estate's taxation, which is super cool and realistic. Uh, and by that, I think he means, like, provinces and such. But yes, your income is based entirely on taxing estates. Very, very yes. Really excited about the expensive standing army being 200 men. Uh, it seems like how Stank's work will be overhauled finally. Uh, no more death stacks. <laughs> I, I don't know if we're never going to get um, death stacks, but yeah, a thousand men in a unit is no longer the issue. So the question, can you confirm whether the, the estate pays for the levies or does the state do? States do not pay for levies unless you count the lots of pops not contributing to the economy anymore. Basically the imperative system, um, it is an opportunity cost rather than a cost cost which obviously makes sense as well for a levy system. Does money spent on stability, because you can, obviously you've got a uh, stability slider, I guess, um, go anywhere or does it disappear into the ether? Lots of money goes into the ether when spent, so it's not going to be like when I increase this slider for the amount I'm spending on getting my stability under control, that money's going to the estates or to whatever. That's not the case. Um, that money is just gone. And there's a lot of people, again, with this one that are somewhat complaining about this, uh, thinking that all money should be tracked and go somewhere and be spent and go somewhere else. Uh, and I kind of disagree. I think... Um, Mayo and taxes really needs to have something that they can, uh, you know, chew on for their EU5 mod. Uh, you got to throw them a couple of bones, and maybe uh, this abstraction uh, is one of the bones that you could throw them. So, uh, yeah, Mayo can probably do this. Uh, I think it's fine that EU5 does not. Probably going to it next week, but what happens uh, to taxes on populations that are not part of any estates? 
doesn't matter because all pops belong to the estate or they won't have power so they won't have any money. So things like there is no slaves estate so slaves do not belong to any estate. But that doesn't matter because they won't have any power and they won't have any money so who cares? It, that's, that's, it is what it is. Uh, will there be monuments? No. That's just a flat no. I don't know. I am a little... I, ki I kind of like the monuments. I kind of like monuments. I'm not going to lie. Uh, this one is one of the ones that kind of disappointed me just a little. Because I do. I do like, I like monuments. Um, they're an interesting mechanic, but hey... That might come later on down the line. That It was a DLC in EU4. It could totally come back. Um, but I know there's a lot of people who dislike monuments. So I'm probably going to get a bit of flame for uh, for saying that I like them. Hey, what can I say? Uh, where is the food bought from or sold to? Hopefully it's not from nowhere and sold to nowhere. So it's from and to the market. Which is a system we need to know more about. If there's no food in the market, they can't buy it. Uh, and if you can't trace a safe path back to the market center, there's no food transaction. So, what this is really saying to me, other than, you know, more evidence of market being the new trade system, but also a little bit deeper, because obviously we know that a province can migrate into a market if that market is strong enough. Um, it was said in one of the previous uh, Tinto talks. Um, and here we know that food is bought and sold on the market as well. But we don't know if this was just a replacement for the trade node system, which is what I initially thought it was. But if food is being bought and sold on that market, that kind of says something else entirely that uh, we're not too sure about just yet what that is. Uh, so, yeah, it could potentially be a mix of trade node and goods being uh, bought and sold uh maybe like a sphere of influence but on the map and not country specific that could be the case uh we will we will find out and by sphere of influence i don't mean the vicky 3 stuff i mean vicky 2 obviously will the cost of buying and selling food be naturally summed up of your whole country since it seems to be on a province basis right now uh, not sure porting food instantly from Vladivostok to St. Petersburg feels realistic. So food is going to not just magically transport. You know, you can't buy food from a market and have it, you know, it, you can't buy food on a market in your, you know, St. Petersburg and then have it magically transport to Vladivostok, which I think is like, you know, on the other side. That's like the furthest to the east. That's like next to China. And St. Petersburg is, like, next to Finland. So, yeah, these, they're very far away, so they're going to have to, you know, engage in their own markets. So, having markets not be entire countries, like, having a country with multiple markets seems to be something that we're going to get. Um, it's not just going to be Russian market, it's going to be the russian market that's around st petersburg like the novgorod market uh which again can grow and shrink depending on how strong it is um and that's kind of cool uh and then somebody asking about you know numbers but no numbers are final that's not too interesting uh here i'm this is this is going to lead on to something johan says because there is you know there's comments and stuff. So, after saying not porting food from Vladivostok to St. Petersburg, uh, but what is the gameplay difference? Is buying more expensive per unit than selling? Uh, yes, and buying income is reduced by lack of control. So, buying income of the estates, because pops don't have income? I, I It's... I don't know. Buying in buying of the province to the province wealth, uh, let's say, is the one buying food. That could be it. Um, will straight tolls be uh, present in the game as diplomatic income and expense? Uh, like the sound toll, which constituted up to two thirds of Denmark's state income, is related to trade. But yes, and again, we really need to learn about trade. Is there a reason why selling food is being chosen as a specific provincial source of income and not selling goods in general? Will provincial economy activity be limited to food? Because food is another thingy. Which basically makes me think that either goods are a completely separate system. Well, I mean, they are a completely separate system. But they're not going to be 
used in the same manner as food. They're not going to be traded in the same way. You're not going to have provinces pulling from food from a market. Goods, if they are tangible and um, bought and sold, firstly, we're looking very Victoria-esque. So I, I could definitely see a system where that's not how goods work at all. Um, I don't think we're going to be seeing a case where um, Stora Copperberget in Dallas Gogan in Sweden is going to produce, you know, X units of uh, copper and that copper is going to go to the market for somebody in Lübeck to buy that copper. I don't see that happening. I do think goods will just be something different, something maybe that we can tax, um, taxing the selling of goods instead of having them goods be tangible and bought and sold and moved around the map because that is i imagine quite computationally intense um but i don't i'm not a i'm not a i'm not a coder i don't i don't know what i'm talking about um uh, i don't know why i had that one twice but we move on um how will estate taxation be balanced when considering tags that do not have those estates are tags that have more estates options just in a better position since they can make more taxes or will there be something else to counterbalance that? More estates is not more money. It's more ways to split the tax base because a hundred influence is the total, right? And the estates are sharing that, including the crown estate, are sharing a piece of that 100. Um, so having more estates is just more ways to split the tax base of the population in that province, not more money, because it's not additive. It's it's sharing a piece of the pie. Uh, moving on, we have here... Uh, will the game distinguish between crown-owned ventures and private ventures? In E4, trade income was treated as a strange blend of the two. Yes. So, that is... a really good question. A really good question that really had no origin really it didn't have anything that prompted it this is just something this guy has come up with and i'm really glad that he did and i'm really glad that johan answered it as well uh, what this means is that your estates your pops your your provinces your market will automatically do a bit of trading but also you as the the crown you as the the state itself can also do a bit of manual trading for yourself and the game will distinguish between the two. We won't have a system where uh, all of the autonomy when it comes to trade is taken out of the player's hands or given to the player. That autonomy is, is shared. Both will have the ability to do their own trading. And I guess we need to wait until the trade, Dev Dari, uh, to figure out what effect that is going to have. Will there be better flags and coat of arms in Project Caesars? One is his nitpicks in E4, he's seeing Somalia use the flag of the modern day country, Somalia, blah, 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 blah. Uh, they're using a similar system to CK3 and Victoria 3, which has dynamic flags and coats of arms, um, which is really cool. Uh, basically, the system is just different. It's not just an image like in E4. In E4, you have an image of a flag, a PNG image. It's not PNG, I think it's DDS, but whatever. You have this image of a flag, it's in a flag folder, the game pulls from that flags folder, and that's what you are shown. It makes it... This is a bit of a double-edged sword. The system that E4 has is much easier for modders. It's especially weaker modders like myself. I can change a flag in E4. I kind of can't in Victoria 3, not that I play it, or... CK3, not that I'd want to because it's got the whole designer. Um, Imperita also used that system. There, I found it very difficult to change flags in that game. Um, and I think that sentiment is not uncommon either. Um, but modders are smart cookies. like they, Modders are magic. So they will be able to work it out. It's just for amateur modders like myself. Or non-modders more like myself. Um... We'll have a harder time, but it is more dynamic. It's more powerful. You can have more things happen. Um, things like, say you have a rebel jump out of your country. You can just like invert the colors and keep the same flag. And it's very, very simple to do. Uh, so yeah, more powerful, more powerful flag stuff. Uh, if an island nation decides to only import food and not produce it themselves, would they starve to death 
uh, eventually, if they were 100% blockaded. Yes, they would. It would take a while, but yes, they would. That is kind of crazy. That's kind of crazy. Um, I'm not sure there will be any cases where an island nation will not have any food production whatsoever. I feel like there's probably... That's not going to exist. Like, every island has the ability to produce some kind of food, right? Um, unless there is no base food growth, and it is simply just a case of, you know, investing into food production that gives you any at all. Uh, which does seem a little bit weird to me. I think every country should have just a base amount, or every province should have a base amount, because unless you're, like, a desert, there's going to be food grown somewhere, right? Surely. Um, but yeah, no, that that's really interesting. It's a really cool idea that the guy had, um, seeing if it is possible to completely starve out a nation, which is kind of grim, not gonna lie. What happens when someone just refuses to surrender in multiplayer and fights a death war to the end? Um, the peace system, maybe it will be the same as E4, because E4 also does have ways to prevent that with the, um, the stab hit peace deals. Um, but we don't know anything about warfare. I think this is actually the first thing that has been mentioned on warfare, other than seeing the, the levy system, um, existing. Uh, but peace system will have ways to attempt to stop people from just fat death warring. Uh, that was the final comment that I want to show you from the Tinto Talks, but there was a couple of other interesting threads, uh, that were, um, shared. Uh, this one is asking why... EU5 or why Project Caesar should have stability at all as a as a value. Uh, they thought that the stability system was a little bit too abstract, even though we're going now from minus 100 to plus 100. So we'll see here. Stability in Project Caesar currently impacts the following. Estate satisfaction equilibrium for all estates. How quickly pops promote. Satisfaction thresholds for pops that are likely to support rebels or not. And a couple of other things that can't be talked about. Uh, and then Mets here, completely separate comment. By the end of the game, most countries should still have around 50% commoners, uh, and Johan expects him to have far, far more than that. Um, however, the reason this is in is because Mets does not know when the end of the game is. Johan knows the end date, but Mets does not. So, what period, what rough year... Did the majority of countries move from having a majority of population, you know, not being commoners? Because honestly, having, you know, more than 50% commoners, that's true from the start of the game to probably up until the Industrial Revolution. Although maybe commoners are also the people that are working in the factories. Honestly, this... this this could really be... I, the more I think about it, the more I think it's maybe a silly question. The commoners are probably still going to be the majority past 1800, so the end date really could be anywhere in that period. Yeah, a silly question. I probably shouldn't have uh, mentioned it. Oh, well, moving on. And right here, we have something huge. Back when the uh, dev diary talking about the population came out, Johan stated... Quite emphatically that they were very unlikely to add new pop types, and that decision has not been rescinded. Except maybe it has, because right now, after Metz is asked about estates having subdivisions, will promotion mean going from commoner to burger to clergy to nobility, etc., he said it also from tribesmen to peasants. Slaves technically promote peasants, instant, and when and where slave is equal, whatever. But tribesmen were not a part of the original pop discussion. They did not exist. That was not a thing that was spoken about. But now, now maybe it is. Now maybe it is. Now we have a new pop type, potentially. This is... Kind of huge. I feel like this this should have been something that was talked about a bit more. Um, this is not been seen, so maybe this is the first time that a lot of people will actually be seeing this. We may, in fact, have another pop type. That's huge. Because one of the big complaints that I saw with regards to the pop types was 
are we going to be calling the people who live in, you know, the Golden Horde? Because 1337, they exist as a really big entity. Or the Great Horde. I can't actually remember what they're called. White Horde, maybe? I don't know. Either way, the steppes. These people aren't peasants. These people aren't commoners. But they could be tribesmen. They could be nomads. Right, they are nomads. Would they fit more into a tribesman pop type? Or would they fit more into a commoner pop type? This is huge. This is something that we did not know. This is something that we now know. Uh, here, talking about the ages system. Um, Project Caesar will not have the ages system of EU4, but it will have ages. Because, of course, he mentioned ages in the Dev Diary itself. Um, seeing that it has ages, that's great. And here, one of the... I mean, I, the pops are huge, right? But, for me personally, I'm really excited about this. Because, starting from the second half of May, we may be doing weekly map posts asking for feedback on another day than the regular day we have for Tinder Talks. We're going to get more maps. And, you know, we are all map gamers. We all love maps. That's kind of our whole thing. So seeing more maps is... Ah, I love it. Beautiful. Uh, this was a a post about how granular the maps are and whether they were going to be updated constantly in the future. I think the post was actually made by the lead developer of the Antebellum mod um, because people enjoying new map updates, really good for the general populace, but for modders, that's a nightmare. Um, but yeah, no, getting more maps in the future... I'm excited. I hope you're excited. We may end up having two Tinto Talk, like, proper videos. Not videos. Proper, like, posts uh, a week. Firstly talking about mechanics, and then separately talking about maps. And I can't wait. That sounds delightful. Uh, here, people talking about sliders. I, I said about it earlier that they think it's false depth, but... I disagree. One of the primary goals of Project Caesar has been the simulation aspect of things, and this is one of them. When there are multiple ways to affect a value, you want to have at least one way to have a rather granular control. Stability is one example we talked about, as uh, the cabinet related to the uh, is a binary on and off impact. The clergy pop ratio is something you do not have any direct impact over in the short term, and the expense slider is your granular control. These are all the things that uh, affect stability. Um... If you're currently at stability 10 and you want to reach, let's say, stability 40 to be able to do something, how long do you want it to take? This way, granular control comes in as if you're, as your preference is not the same as another person's. The situation you're in, you have to consider Y and somebody else has to consider Z, D, uh, B, and D. Makes sense to me. Um, this guy likes keeping his armies at 50%-ish quality. Basically, again, this is all talking about sliders being false depth. Uh, somebody saying that even the army maintenance slider in EU4 was useless. Um, Arrow just said he wanted to keep his army at 50%. So if somebody declares war or if, you know, rebels and whatever. And Johan does the same. Uh, so that's that. And here, uh, the comment that I mentioned earlier, it's easier for the AI to have sliders to work with. Uh, and then finally, we have this one here, um, talking about control. With 10% control in a province, uh, there's 10 ducats available out of a base tax of 100. With 20% uh, crown, the uh, when 20% the crown gets two ducats, and estates get eight, and the rest is gone. Estates aren't against you. Uh, increase the control to 30% because now you get six ducats and they get 24. Without 100% control, wealth always vanishes. Correct. So, yes, it's true that if you if there's 10, 10 ducats, the effective base tax with 10% control and 100 possible tax in a location. However, crown power has no relevance at this level. Let's say the power distribution in that location is 50% nobles, 25% clergy, and 25% commoners. There's no town or city, so he doesn't have to do burgers. The nobles get 5 ducats, which is 50% of the 10% of the 100. Right? There is... 10% and 100% possible tax, that's 10 possible taxes. If the nobles have 50%, that's 5, uh, five ducats. With the privileges and laws, we're allowed to tax them at a maximum of 20%, so we can take between 0 and 1 ducat because of that. Clergy gets 25% of the 10 ducats, so 2.5, but we're paying the Catholic, um, as we're playing a Catholic, max is 0, so they take all the money. 
Commoners get 2.5 ducats as well, same power as the clergy, but they have no privileges and less power in the country, so the max tax is 50. So we can tax between 0 and 1.25, depending on how pissed off we want to make them. Really good breakdown of how the tax system works. So basically, you want to increase your control, because control determines how much you make, right? If there's 100 ducats in a province, and there's 50% control, only 50% of that um, is going to be taxed. Um, and then it is also further declined by your privileges. Really, really cool system. I really like that he's gone into depth and explained a little bit of this. Uh, he asks, what happens to the rest of the 90 ducats? Um, you know, because 10% control of the 100. Where's the other 90 ducats? What are the ducats? They don't exist. There's nobody going around collecting taxes. There's no local administration trying to determine how much you should pay. Local warlords seize stuff and they keep what they can keep. And again, I think this is perfectly fine. Um, there was another argument after this, as there always is, uh, where people are saying basically that the that money, that 90 ducats, should remain in the province and the commoners should be able to use it to do X, Y, and Z. And again, my idea is that, that just let May and Taxes handle that level of simulation. This is a good abstraction. This is way, way deeper than E4. And this will work. Let's let it work and we'll see about you know if if we need a, a deeper uh, level of simulation that's fine for eu uh, eu4 sorry eu5's my own taxes to do uh and then literally the very final thing uh someone asking about conquistadors they'll work really different to anything we've seen in previous paradox games great good uh i'm not a big fan of conquistadors or explorers in eu4 uh, so very happy to see that they'll be different. But that is it. That is all the things I would like to share with you today. Um, tomorrow there will be a new Tinto talk. It will be about the economy. Uh, specifically, the uh, what we'll be talking about is how tax base functions and the food system and some other related issues. I'm super looking forward to that. I hope you're super looking forward to that. If you want to see it, hit the follow button. No, it's, this is YouTube. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, likes, comments are always welcome. They really help out with the algorithm. And uh, if you're not subscribed and you want to keep up to date with the Project Caesar EU5-ness, um, yeah, that subscribe and, and we'll, we'll, we'll learn all of the stuff together. It'll be a great time. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.